The Lord be with you. Well, it's great to be back here. Really fantastic. Uh, last year we were absolutely packed, and this year we are. Yeah, that, that wasn't bad for the beginning. Yeah, very good. Um, with this, uh, uh, I've got a few kind of pictures and overheads, and I'll, I'll sort of I'll put my hand up every now and then, and Chris will click the next one. Um, so what I'm just planning to do over the next hour or so is just a little bit of a, a kind of light review of where USBG has been over the last year. If it's the case that I finish inside of the time, then we can feel blessed by the Lord, uh, and those who haven't managed to get into their rooms will be able to do that. If, I'm, if it looks like I'm pushing up against the time, then someone can shout at me. Is that okay? Or in fact, you can all shout at me. That would also be fine too. I can see someone at the front who's very happy to volunteer. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it's a great joy to be back amongst uh, so many friends, uh, the USPG family. Um, and may I extend a particularly warm welcome to those who are here for the first time with us. Uh, we hope you have a really good uh, time, um, in, not just in listening to the fabulous lineup of speakers that we have, but also in all those important conversations in between, where we really learn from one another and have really good fellowship together. It's an image that I've shared on a number of occasions, um, one that I just feel um, really conveys quite powerfully what it means for us to be in Christ and what it means for us to share as different churches and different contexts and different cultures come together. And that's the image of the Eucharistic cup, the cup of wine. And I think it's particularly important uh, when we reflect on the nature of the prophetic. If you remember, the cup is a cup of wrath. It is a cup of bitterness, as well as being a cup of rejoicing, the cup that overflows, the cup that brings us so much and it's that dual sense of that cup. And it seems to me that in the Christian life together, what we are together doing is we are sharing our brokenness, our suffering, our vulnerability together, but we are also sharing our joy. We are sharing the joys that we have with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So that kind of image of, as it were, the Eucharistic cup being held up and being held by us, each individually, but together collectively, is one I just think captures something of what I think may be going on for us in the next couple of days, as indeed it does uh, capture something of what it means to be the body of Christ, what it really means to be rooted um, in Christ. Before I go on and, and have a little bit of a review of the year, which will be perhaps a little bit more significant for those who have followed USPG and, and been part of the family for a while, and, and for those who are, who are visitors or new, maybe uh, um, perhaps a, a little less familiar, let me just say a couple of things about the program, um, because we have a few changes. Um, and the first is uh, the little later at seven, very sadly, um, the Right Reverend Dr. Probel um, Dutta has not been able to make it to this country. Um, and I'm delighted to say that Bishop Victor, I don't know, is Bishop Victor here? Yes, there we are, Bishop Victor, who's now standing, oh, he was standing up for a second, has very kindly uh, stepped into the breach uh, and will be speaking earlier uh, in that first slot. And then, if I may put it like this, even more nobly, uh, Bishop Dixon of Sendra Tanganyika, who, who wasn't down at all uh, to speak, has responded to our warm invitation <laughs> at short notice uh, to stand in. And he will be speaking uh, first thing uh, tomorrow morning. So is Bishop Dixon here? Just let me please embarrass you. Yes, there you are. That is Bishop Dixon. 
Thank you very much indeed for, for coming and sharing with us tomorrow. It's, we're extremely grateful and, and we very much look forward to that. The other um, thing is to say that unfortunately Bishop Ozzy Swartz uh, is not able to join us either, so he won't be there in the Journey With Us session tomorrow, and nor with those who've got really clear, um, acute eyesight, nor will he be preaching, therefore, on Wednesday. Now, at this stage, <laughs> however, uh, I'm delighted to say, really, really delighted to say, that Bishop Eleanor, who's, can I tempt her to stand up? Yeah, just thank you, Bishop Eleanor. Has, has very kindly agreed to preach for us on Wednesday morning. We're, we're really looking forward to that uh, immensely. Um, she did say earlier that she would be preaching in Kiswahili, uh, and we did have volunteers to translate, but um, we'll, we'll see what decision she makes on Wednesday morning. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Bishop Eleanor. And can I just extend um, our warm, warm... Uh, welcome to all those who are visiting us um, from different parts of the world. Um, it's a real honour and a privilege and a pleasure for us to have you with us here. And as those who come regularly to this conference know, it is, it is the speakers that make this such a tremendous gathering. So thank you very much indeed uh, to all of you. So, we're here to renew fellowship. We're here to deepen conversation. We're here to have new encounters and conversations and make connections. But we're also here to look at a particular theme. Those who are here last year will remember that we looked at the sustainable development goals. We looked at prosperity, people, the planet, peace, and partnership. And in a sense, this conference on the prophetic voice is a development of some of those themes. It's about how the church gives voice when it speaks up, how it speaks to power, how it gives hope to others, how through word and deed the church, churches are communities of hope and resistance, how they challenge the cultures of silences and lies. And we don't have to think too hard about our world to see the need for the prophetic voice. We live in a world where it would appear at this moment some rather macho uh, male leaders of charismatic kind of power, little demigods walk across our planet. We live in a time where racism and nationalism appear to be on the rise. We are all acutely aware of environmental problems and challenges, and of course, of the challenges of migration and the movement of peoples. And we'll hear a little bit about that uh, tomorrow. And we've heard it's John the Baptist Day. We've heard of the prophetic Mary. And of course, we reflect on Jesus' own self-consciousness of standing in that powerful prophetic tradition. And I just want to read very quickly the Nazarene Manifesto, just to put that back into your head. Also from Luke, uh, from chapter 4. You remember, he's in Nar Nazareth. He's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolls it. He finds the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is what we're here to reflect on and think about in terms of the life of our churches over the next couple of days. 
and it could take many, many forms. I'll just share with you one. I don't think, I don't think we have anybody here from the Anglican Church in Korea. Anybody? No. So, so in that sense, I'm adding, if I, if I may put it like that, to what the speakers may, may have to say. What does mission look like today? One small example. The Archbishop of Korea has come to an arrangement with the criminal justice system in Korea, in a way which may surprise you. First-time youth offenders are given a choice. They can either go to jail or they can go for a walk. They can go for a walk with the Archbishop, Archbishop Moses, over the mountains for about 200 kilometers. <laughs> it's a tough walk. And the rules are terribly simple. The archbishop doesn't seek to speak to the young people in question. He doesn't impose himself upon them. The walk is tough. Guess what happens? As they walk and they continue to walk, they start to reflect and think. And the walk is tough. And they begin to sidle up to the archbishop and they start to talk. And they start to come undone a bit themselves. And they start to repent, to feel sorry. And they end up writing letters to their parents and to the victims of their crimes. And if they stay for the whole two weeks and they go back to the judge, he puts a line through it and says, you don't go to jail, you don't have a criminal record. Extraordinary extraordinary bit of mission activity initiated by the church in cooperation with the state who see that it makes sense and the success rate has been really quite phenomenal. I just thought I'd share, share that with you as a bit of really kind of quite creative mission which is about you know the redemption of people uh, and, and helping young people uh, on, a, on, a, on a different path literally a different path to the one that they might have been going along. Okay, we, we shall explore, and I really look forward to our explorations around the prophetic uh, over the next couple of days. But at this stage, I'd just like to have a little bit of a, a, a sort of canter through the year of USPG, um, just to give you a sense of, of what has happened since last year um, so, uh, ooh, that wasn't the right way. Hands going up for a, for a click to the, okay, and we can go on again. So, uh, Greenbelt, uh, USPG has been at Greenbelt now for a number of years. Um, and uh, that's a great opportunity for us to engage, particularly with, uh, I was going to say, particularly with young people, but also with those group of people who go to Greenbelt who, who may be a fraction older than that as well. And there are a couple. Uh, and it's uh, a great, of course, not, not these individuals here. Uh, and it gives us a great opportunity, particularly to talk about uh, the Journey With Us program, but a range of activities uh, that you, as, if you spot yourself, do, do shout out. Um, okay. Uh, and then perhaps the next one. Um, and this last year, um, we had a panel um, looking at the the white saviour complex narratives. Um, and here you see uh, Evie in full flow. Hi, Evie. Uh, along with uh, Richard Bartlett, uh, Professor Anthony Reddy, and Rebecca Boardman. So really exploring some of those dynamics around decolonization uh, and, and how we might work things better in, in, in terms of the relationship between this country uh, and, and, and other parts of the world. Um, and that's a theme that perhaps we'll come back a little bit to. Uh, oh, that's, isn't that a great shot? Love that shot. Very good. Ah. Um, and then the second theme um, that we explored there, this is uh, Father Chris Ablon from the Independent uh, Philippine Church. Um, one of the, back in 2016, uh, we, every three years, we have an international consultation where 
representatives from partner churches come together to say, what are the main issues? What is it that we need to talk about? And in Fiji in 2016, as many of you know, the environment was a very important issue. But a second issue which came up was really talking about those churches um, where they are facing um, really significant challenges for standing up and being prophetic. Uh, and the churches in the Philippines have been pretty courageous in standing up about the human rights abuses uh, that have gone, un gone on under Duterte and others. Uh, and Father Ablon uh, articulated some of that uh, within the context of, um, uh, of Greenbelt. And there is, um, we've got a fair amount of literature over there. You may have spotted the, the piles. Um, and you might just want to have a little bit look at uh, Struck Down But Not Destroyed, which is uh, an account of defending human rights in the Philippines. So do have a little bit of a look at that, pick that one up and take it away uh, with you. W when we were preparing for this, um, we suddenly realized that, that we, we'd only produced this last August. We thought this had been around for quite a long time. Um, we had realized that the conference hadn't actually seen that. So do, do have a little bit of a look at that uh, and take one of those away with you. Um, so that was a second theme that we uh, explored at Greenbelt. Uh, and then, obviously, the worship, and then um, we'll move on to celebration at All Saints uh, Margaret Street. So we had 81 former uh, members of staff and mission per personnel, uh, and we were very um, delighted to have, um, there we go, uh, Father Herbert of the Anglican Chaplain, the Anglican Chaplain of the Filipino community in the Diocese of Leicester, uh, who spoke to us then. Um, and there we are, Habib, talking about journey with us. Okay. Um, in September, I had the great privilege of going to Korea to speak at the Council of Churches of East Asia. So the CCE, CCEA, there are two big regional gatherings within the Anglican Church. Uh, one is uh, that of Kappa, which is the Council of Anglican Provinces in Africa, and the other is the CCEA, the churches uh, in East Asia. They've been meeting regularly since 1956. So this is a very, very well-established uh, organization. And I had the great privilege of being able to go and speak and, as it were, to wave the USPG flag, uh, which I did vigorously, you'll be happy to know, um, and to do two Bible studies on the nature of leadership um, looking at uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. If anyone's studied the theology of, of 2 Corinthians, do come and chat to me afterwards. Um, it's not the easiest of, uh, of letters to, uh, to speak on. We had an extremely good and profound discussion about the nature of leadership within different contexts and, and how authority uh, operates. And um, this, if you just come to the next slide as well, um, rather dramatic picture here. We were meeting here, looking across to North Korea, uh, and there was a service um, of peace and reconciliation looking across. That's the Archbishop of Southeast Asia. Um, it's a two-mile strip. I mean, one or two of you may have been there. It's a two-mile strip of water. I grew up by the sea, and it looked like, that's an easy do. I could, I could swim that. That would be, that would be good. Uh, except, of course, it wouldn't be terribly good. Um, if you look across to the other side, the land is absolutely stripped, completely stripped. It, it's desolate. All the firewood and everything has, has gone. It's quite a, it's quite a stark uh, image. Um, okay. The other, perhaps another thing, just to update from uh, last quite sure we've got two things on top of each other, but um, this is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We, um, last year we looked at the um, Sustainable Development Goals here and we produced a uh, Lent course, which people may have used. Um, in, if we go to the next one, we coordinated a group uh, of religious leaders uh, with a letter to Theresa May, uh, 
pressing her to engage in a consultation process with faith leaders, uh, which did indeed take place. So a day was put aside uh, at which the SDGs were discussed. Uh, that was an initiative in entirely driven by USPG. Uh, and, and in that sense was very successful, and that this week the products of that will be being presented at the UN high-level political forum. Um, so that's just to show you, you know, some of the continuity through from discussions that we had last year here, that it, these things can have an impact uh, for, you know, in other places going forward. Um, and, and that's just a couple of... Um, ways in which that message got across. So, so the voice of faith in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals has been heard within the kind of political uh, uh, forum. Okay. So moving on then to uh, February this year, this is a time really of, of, of new beginnings. And I just want to quickly talk about two things. Uh, one is open to encounter which is this document here. Some of you may have already seen this, but this is our attempt really to articulate what it is that USPG is seeking to do at this time. What does it mean to be a mission agency in the 21st century? Clearly the title, Open to Encounter, is talking about something which is around dialogue. It's around conversation. We need to be encountering, engaging, discussing, listening, uh, to different groups uh, within our own society and listening to one another across the Anglican Communion. And within that, you'll find uh, a, a discussion of the various sorts of, uh, of programs and activities that USPG are engaged in. Um, and in the centre, uh, to sort of mirror the idea of a dialogue, there is a discussion between me um, and a, a young woman called Justina, who's a, a performer... Um, and, and uh, rising um, theatre director. Just to give you a sense of what it is that we're trying to do uh, within USPG at this moment in time. And we've also, um, and this was launched at, at Bray Day. Um, this is Archbishop Winston. It looks like it's a very similar picture to the one before, isn't it? It's clearly an Archbishop look. Um, uh, sorry, is Archbishop Winston here? No, I think he might be here tomorrow. So we, I could have asked him to perhaps. Yeah. So um, Archbishop Winston, who, who preached for us back in February at our Bray Day, which is our Founders Day and, and that anniversary. Um, and then we launched the document at the General Synod in February. Um, I've, I've been a member of General Synod uh, prior to coming to USCG for about 10, 10 years. Very rarely do you ever get more than one or two bishops in a room. A little bit like magnets. They, you know, when they push away, uh, one bishop will turn up. But to get more than that is quite a challenge. Um, five diocesan bishops came along and gave every impression of being really quite engaged uh, with what the USPG might be, might be about and what we were might seeking to do. Um, so I think we were, we were really pleased with that. Um, and we'll be following those conversations up uh, with a range of our uh, diocesan bishops. So do, do please have a look at this, um, and, and if you've got any comments, just come back to me, uh, you know, let, let us know. If you think it's a good document, then feel free to push it around a little bit. Um, uh, and as you can see from the cover, we're, we're trying to you know, conjure a sense of the kind of dialogues that can go on intergenerationally between the more traditional and all those kind of forces of globalization that are going on constantly within our world. Uh, so there's a sense of dynamism. Um, and within that, um, oh, that's, is Janice, you here, Janice? Yes. yes. Hello, Janice. Oh. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> very, very kindly, ja Janice, Janice uh, chaired our session with the General Synod. Okay. Um, so you'll remember last year I talked about kind of three uh, big strategic aims, and I just thought I'd quickly remind you a little bit of those as we kind of go through. Um, the first is we talked about rethinking mission, that we've got to be engaged in a, a, a critical discussion about what it means uh, to engage in mission today. So we're trying to bring together people from different parts of the global church 
in mutually enriching conversations and profound encounters to increase an, our own understanding and deepen our discipleship as intercultural Christians. Not cross-cultural, but intercultural. What do I mean by intercultural is that we, we listen to, su- to one another in such a way that we take on board part of what it means to be a Christian in a different context. There's a real listening. We are changed. We are transformed through our encounters with those, with Christians from other contexts, from other cultures. And our Christian faith is deepened, deepened as a result of that process. Um, and then energizing uh, church and community. In many places I go, I say, I'm interested in a bold, confident, joyful Christianity. That's how we should be. Of course the world is tough. Absolutely, we know that. Of course there are challenges. Of course there are sorrows. But actually we need to be energizing church uh, and community life. Uh, and then finally... Uh, And this is something that perhaps we'll be thinking a little bit as we reflect on the nature of the prophetic, that that central aspect of championing justice, championing justice and naming and calling out injustice. (coughs) It's a deep, deep thread within the scriptures and within the life of Jesus and, of course, within uh, the life of John the Baptist as we reflect on him today. Why was Jesus crucified? You could say in part because he ate with the wrong people. That's true to a large extent. (laughs) But it's also because he called out and challenged at all sorts of levels the injustices of his day. Oh, that's... um, What's that? Um, yes, uh, uh, yes. There was a, there was a, we um, popped along to Lambeth Palace, where um, uh, <laughs> this man here. Yes, that was It was a nice little occasion. The Archbishop of Korea happened to be in town, and he sang the gospel in tradition, traditional Korean chant, which was extremely <laughs> moving. I have to say, it was very, it was very good. Um, also, at that time, we had the House of Bishops of Korea. Um, spent eight days with USPG staff. And that was a really good, um, it was a good time, it was a good example of the way in which USPG could engage. There are three bishops in the, um, uh, in the Anglican Church of Korea. It was a really good opportunity for us to really engage with the whole province as they were looking to think about how they went forward as a province in mission. So that was a really wonderful opportunity. And then the... Um, okay, and on. Uh, John mentioned the other big new beginning for us is that we have a new building. Um, this is um, Archbishop Josiah, uh, the Secretary General of the Anglican Community Office, who opened our building along with uh, a range of uh, other visitors uh, in 5 Trinity Street, um, in South London, just off Borough High Street. Do come and see us. Uh, I'd love this to be a place of hospitality, of welcome, of coming together, uh, and it will be a place for, for various events. Um, and if you happen to know anybody who wants to rent a bit of space in South London, also call them because we've got the top floor to rent out. Um, so, uh, you know, seriously, talk to me. Um, uh, but it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a really beautiful building. We've been extremely uh, blessed by the decision of the trustees to really invest for the future of USPG uh, by, through the purchase of this building. Um, and we had a, uh, a, uh, a the, the basement has a, a space that we've converted into a bit of a chapel. Uh, and here we have the Archbishop uh, of Tanzania, uh, Mainbo, uh, celebrated for us and preached for us. And for those with very attentive eyes, that is a gluten-free wafer. Uh, I thought I could see one or two who had spotted that. Um, but uh, so, in that sense, we were entirely inclusive. Um, the next thing, and this really picks up on the Rethinking Mission, we had a great 
rethinking, each year we have a rethinking mission conference. This year it was in Liverpool. Um, and what we were trying to do there was to explore um, some of the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the long, long legacies uh, of that. And we had four um, really outstanding speakers uh, who were reflecting on, on that situation. Um, so uh, Winnie Varghese, who's uh, from Trinity Church, um, Wall Street. Uh, Michael Clark, who is the principal of Codrington College. I'll come back to that in a moment. Rose Hudson Wilkin, who is the Speaker of the House of Commons. Just uh, <laughs> 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 walk. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous that you're all awake. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I, I wasn't sure. Now I know. What are we afraid of tonight? Yes. Chaplin. Uh, and David Eschen, who's a, a lecturer. Um, re representing um, Daniel's from Ghana. Um, Rose was brought up in Jamaica. Um, Michael uh, Codrington College, for those of you who don't know, theological college in Barbados. It was where USPG had its had a, a, a slave plantation until the emancipation in 1834. So it has that um, very complex, difficult, painful uh, history. Um, and he spoke, the title I had up a moment, Barbados Built Liverpool, was a line that Michael came out with. I think it's a very powerful way of just summing up the extraordinary way in which um, the prosperity of this country was so uh, indebted to, to the slave trade. Uh, so that was his, his way of kind of capturing that. So we had a very good day exploring those legacies, having some of those difficult conversations and challenging some of the narratives that are repeated again and again. Any, uh, some of you may remember the, when we had the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade commemorations in 2007. People, were people remember some of that? Uh, and uh, there was a very big critique of them that there was a lot of emphasis on white abolitionists. People referred to it as a Wilberfest. Uh, too much focus on, on Wil William Wilberforce. And very little focus, for example, uh, on those who were enslaved, who resisted, uh, who's, who's, who, who took agency into their own hands, who resisted uh, and who often uh, suffered death uh, or torture and death as a consequence. So that was one of the, that kind of, strong narrative was something we just wanted to bring it back out into the open and discuss and be a little bit more honest about um, and, and challenge that sort of uh, story and myth making that is part of the way that all too often uh, the British have thought about their history. Or as one put, person put, put it to me about, about abolitionism, it's, a, it's like the arsonist who's gone into the house you know, the, the place has gone up and then they've turned up with a bucket of water to chuck it off. You know, it's that sort of, you know, which captures something. Um, so that was, as you might imagine, quite a rich uh, day exploring some really key questions. Um, and then the last bit I just want to um, talk a little bit about is uh, our consultation in Barbados. I mentioned that once every three years, we bring together representatives from different provinces around the Anglican Communion to, to do, I mean, in this case, really to do three things. One is to say, okay, so is USPG doing what you want us to do? Are we genuinely serving the churches of the Anglican Communion? Is what we're doing useful? Is it helpful? That's one thing. The second thing was to reflect on the context of Barbados with, all, with, with that complex history. And the third thing was to look a little bit at church and state. Um, the, if you go around the Anglican Communion, 
Churches are in very, very different situations when it comes to the relationship to political power. Um, this, this was very clear when we were in Barbados because we had a reception at the Governor General's um, place, which was lovely. Uh, there were lots of church people there. Uh, and it spoke of a close relationship between church and state, uh, of quite a lot of harmony, of, of being able to see the world in the same sort of way. Um, but amongst those uh, who were gathered with us, there were those Christian leaders who were very much in a minority situation, uh, perhaps where they, the state was Islamic uh, and they were a, a, a minority uh, religious position. Um, so we explored some of those issues. We explored issues around um, how churches could avoid being co-opted by the state. Um, how churches could avoid being bought off, if you want, or, or, or corrupted, um, which is really a challenge. Um, and on, the, on conversely, where they were a small group, how they could stand up for themselves, or how they could make alliances with other groups in partnership um, to, to uh, support themselves. So this was um, uh, in the cathedral. Uh, we were very fortunate to have um, Agnes Boehm from the World Council of Churches. She is in the yellow, looking very distinctive there against the red and the white, um, uh, 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 representing also the um, Church of Kenya. Uh, she's the moderator of the um, Central Council of the World Council of Churches. Um, a fantastic speaker uh, and brought a, a lot to our week. Um, and then uh, representatives from across the world. We were there at the invitation of the Church of the Province uh, of the West Indies. Uh, and we had a very good opportunity uh, to reflect on, as I say, the nature of church and state. Um, there we, you see Ben there in the middle? Uh, uh, drumming alongside the... Um, uh, Archbishop of Tanzania there um, and then we also had a um, you probably can't quite read uh, the writing here but this was the, the chapel the Church of the Holy Cross um, which was part of uh, the Codrington estate and there was a service there for the 200th anniversary uh, of that building which was originally built uh, in 1819. Um, so there was a, that was quite a powerful service um, on that occasion there. Um, and, and that's us. We, we gathered in the Codrington Estate just again, just to discuss. Um, it, 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 it's an extraordinary place because it's incredibly beautiful. And alongside that incredible beauty, you know what went on, that the brutality, uh, you know, paradise and, and hell combined. It, you know, it's very, and I think without being, without being self-indulgent, for me, standing there and knowing that my predecessors, those who stood in my shoes as predecessors, as it were, were the people uh, in the 18th century, etc., who um, colluded with, supported, the enslavement of, of persons <coughs> in Codrington was, was very powerful. And it's something that is, is, is part of our history and something that we need to uh, acknowledge uh, and, and um, seek to find ways of moving forward from. And then finally, uh, we came up, we had a conference communicate. So if you're interested in, in uh, the relationship between church and state, if you're interested in how Anglicans might sort of think about uh, political power, do go to uh, our website and you'll see a, a relatively short statement of the reflections of those who are present, um, just thinking about um, how, we, uh, how we relate to uh, the state. And we, we talk about the state, but of course we know nowadays power, serious power comes in all sorts of different forms. Are we in the world of nation states anymore? Or, or do we have, you know, there are uh, multinational companies with a huge amount of power. 
Uh, and then there are, of course, those superpowers who, who have all sorts of influence in all sorts of different ways. So this is about church and state, but it also is about the bro that broader relationship uh, between the Christian faith and um, political power. So our calling, we, one of the things that we concluded, our calling as Christians dema demands, quite a strong word, demands that churches act as the conscience of humanity to speak truth to power and to speak out against injustice and corruption. And that's perhaps a line which takes us uh, neatly into what we'll be looking at over the next couple of days. So do please go to the website uh, and have a little bit of a, a reflection. Um, like I say, it's only a page long on, on, on that statement. Um, and just sift through it, see whether you agree or not. Um, and then um, finally, um, I just want to talk about next year. Um, John Nielsen has already said that uh, we won't be here. We'll be in Swanwick, which I think has a capacity of about 420. Uh, the reason for that is quite deliberate. Um, we have put it on the, the Monday to the Wednesday of... Um, I think it's on the next screen. Where are I? Uh, um, let's come back to that. Uh, yes, the, the 20th to the 23rd. Put it in your diary. Um, it's followed immediately by the Lambeth Conference. The plan here is that we might have one or two bishops gathered uh, during the Monday to the Wednesday, and then we can put them on a coach and they can sail down to Lambeth. Um, so that, that, that's the plan. Now, if I just go back one, one screen, um, I just want to talk Greek for a moment. Um, I'm a really appalling linguist. I mean, really, really bad. You're, you're nodding away, but really bad. I'm a really bad linguist. Um, and uh, this is a Greek word, obviously. Um, and uh, you, some of you will know that it probably means something like friend and stranger, something like that. Um, it's really about, it's a word which relates to hospitality. It's a word which is about love of strangers. Xenos is the stranger, but actually, strangely, Xenos can be guest, host, or stranger. In fact, Rather than simply love of stranger, what this Greek word means is the delight, the delight that you can take in the relationship that develops between a guest and a host. You know, that's something that is surprising. There's something that produces laughter, delight. There's something that goes beyond, yeah? That is what that Greek word means. And the reason I put it there is because we have an opportunity uh, next year. <laughs> yeah. It's going backwards and forwards, it makes it complicated. Uh, we have an opportunity next year um, because there's something called the Hospitality Initiative. And on Wednesday, I'm going to ask the aforementioned and the afore portrayed, as it were, that's right, we're putting it, Janice, to talk a little bit about the Land of Hospitality uh, Initiative. Um, but what we're asking um, anybody who would like to is that as supporters of USPG, you might host a bishop from somewhere, uh, some part of the Anglican Communion, in the days just ahead of the conference, and then bring them along to the conference. So if you would be interested in that sort of act of hospitality uh, and of care, um, and, and if I can use another phrase, and therefore be open to encounter, to the encounter with someone from a different context and a different culture, um, then mull over that over the next sort of 48 hours or so. Janice will give you more details, but if, you, if you'd like to be hosting somebody and then bring them to the conference, then that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, so we'll come back to that uh, on Wednesday. If you're in the situation where you think, well, I would love to do that, I think it's a great idea, but it's entirely impractical for me at this particular moment in time or, or, or whatever, but I'm, I'm, I think it's such a good idea that I'd like to help in some way or another, in some other way, like through financial support or something, then also give us a show. 
but we'll come back to that on Wednesday. But I just wanted to put that idea into your head at this stage as an opportunity for this time next year at conference. Thank you. And I think I've, I've ended a, a little bit at the early end. Um, if, if there were sort of people who, yay, I like that, that was great, yay. Um, which will allow those people who haven't put bags in their rooms to slip away. If anybody did want to ask any questions, of course, of course, very happy to, to, to answer any questions, though, you know, around for the next two, two days, obviously.